you've experienced the Elder Scrolls series in your own way, but want to learn more about its story. Well, to get to the heart of the story, you have to go back to the beginning. There once lived an artist by the name of Darius Shano, who had used his vivid dreams to inspire others for years through song and spoken word. This Breton had garnered much fame due to his use of beautiful imagery and elegant language. The Daedric Prince Vermina was very proud of her artist, seeing as she commanded the Breton's dreams and thus served as his inspiration. While Vermina held great affection for him, the attentions of a Daedric prince often leads to mischief, and this tale is no different. Vermina and the Daedric prince Sheogorath looked down upon the Breton as he slept. The mad god said that it was not people's love that made Vermina's artist great, but their hatred. If great men are usually hated as much as they are loved, then could Vermina conjure hatred in the artist as well? Vermina conceded that mortals were indeed foolish and petty insects, given to despising those among them who have great vision. She also believed that she could sow such seeds of hatred in the heart of the artist and those around him. To prove her point, Vermina accepted a wager offered by Lord Sheogareth. She would enter the mind of Darius Shano and poison his thoughts with horrific nightmares. Then, in ten years' time, she would allow Sheogareth to do the same, and they would see whose talents were the greater. Vermina was supremely confident, for she knew the Mad God could never be as suited to the task of crafting nightmare visions as the dream weaver herself. Darius had always been afraid of the night, but now the terror of darkness was overpowering, absolute. No peace was to be had in his slumber, only horror and an empty, unnameable dread. He would scream at the top of his lungs, only to find his shrieks had been smothered by the cold and eternal dark. When Darius clawed his way to wakefulness, the fear would be gone, for his faith in Vermina was steadfast and resolute. In time, Vermina visited him directly and whispered softly in his ear, Watch carefully, my beloved. Vermina tore away the veil she had mercifully put up and revealed to her disciple visions of death and anguish so profound it made Darius's former night terrors seem pale and small by comparison. The Daedric Prince showed him visions of murder, torture, and creatures so intensely horrific that anguished screams would fill his mind each time he closed his eyes. These agonizing nightmare images tore at his soul and soon revealed themselves in his compositions. The grotesque images filled his work and the horrors they held transfixed his audience with the ghastliness of their impressions the public was disgusted by his words. Even as they were undeniably compelled and fascinated by them, they trembled in delicious indignation, fretting over every detail, even as they condemned the imagery itself. Some gloried in the lurid spectacle, and Darius Shano found his popularity surging, even as it fed the flames of righteous outrage in others. This continued for ten years, while Darius grew increasingly infamous, and then, as suddenly as his nightmares had begun, all at once, they stopped. Vermina's time was up, you see. It was now Sheogoreth's turn to play with poor Darius. Darius was relieved that his night terrors had finally ceased. 
But he was confused as well. He wondered what had changed to make his mistress Vermina forsake him. He made heartfelt prayers to her, pleading for just a sliver of the inspiration she had once bestowed upon him. No answer ever came, and Darius's devastating nightly horrors faded away into long, empty periods of deep, dreamless sleep. In time, the ever-present self-doubt every artist feels, no matter how inspired their work, surfaced in Darius's pieces. With it came bitterness and cynicism, as his goddess continued to ignore his supplications. As the prose and imagery in his work grew stale, interest, however contentious in Darius Shannon's work, began to decline. His abandonment by Vermina had led him to a place where he could no longer provoke the outrage and indignation he once had. As his notoriety began to fade, his resentment increased, directed at the muse who had forsaken him. Sacrilege was close behind, and in short order, hatred followed. This manifested as sarcastic ridicule, then finally disbelief, as Darius came to believe his mistress Vermina had never truly spoken to him at all. It had been in his mind all along, the ravings of a lonely, maladjusted man. His shame and anger and guilt were overwhelming. The man who had once touched the heart of a deity slowly drifted away into irreverent disrespect and even heresy. As Darius's desperation grew, so did the intentionally outrageous behavior in his subsequent work. He became purposely offensive, trying in vain to approach his former infamy. He focused on the gods, challenging their might, and mocking them obscenely. He dared them to strike him down for his blasphemy, and insulted them all the more when no such punishment appeared. More, he targeted public figures, officials, and even his adoring public, scurrying them with venomous caricatures, sparing none and attacking all. His audience, for their part, hated him all the more, meeting his attacks with ever more indignation, for while he had once assaulted their sensibilities, he now struck directly at their hearts and insulted their very spirit. Before long, he had committed his final offense by scorning the emperor god Tiber Septim in the piece he called The Noblest Fool. He mocked the divine emperor for his integration into the cult of the nine divines. After twenty years, Darius's fate was sealed. The king of the high rock city of Dania, who had been sullied by this insignificant worm on more than one occasion, seized this opportunity. For the offense of sacrilege against the empire, Darius's throat was slit with a ceremonial knife, and his final gurgling words spewed forth on a torrent of black blood. The crowds cheered his demise, for they hated him. Twenty years after their initial wager, Vermine and Shiogorath met again over the headless, blood-stained corpse of the artist Darius Shano. The Dreamweaver was livid, for in the name of their wager she had tormented the mortal endlessly for ten years. Yet Shiogorath, on the other hand, had spoken to him not once. He had replaced Vermina's subtle whispers with absolute, deafening silence. Darius Shano had been cut off completely from that which gave him comfort and meaning. For ten long years, Shiogorath denied the artist the attention he had craved so desperately, the attention of a god. Without Vermina's dreams to guide him, Shano had been cast adrift, and his rage had ripened under the withering heat of hate and resentment. Before his death, Darius was a madman. This artist, who was once Vermina's most prized mortal, now served Sheogorath as his servant, bound forever to the Shivering Isles. And thus did Sheogorath teach Vermina that without madness there are no dreams and no creation. It is said, Vermina has never forgotten this lesson. Vermina is the Daedric Prince of dreams and nightmares, and it is she from whom evil omens issue forth. Referred to as Vermina the Gifter and the Dreamweaver, she is seen as one of the most demonic of Daedric Lords. Scholars have claimed that her sphere of influence 
is connected to psychological torture. She has been historically associated with Nolak Ball in regards to a cure for the curse of vampirism, though the details of the connection is as of yet unknown. Vermina's place of oblivion is known as Quagmire. It is a realm of nightmares made flesh, where reality shifts regularly and each random incarnation is more horrifying than the last. It is the realm most easily accessible by mortals who enter by way of their dreams, but usually forget the experience upon waking. From her citadel in the center of Quagmire, Vermina touches sleeping mortal minds, collecting memories, and leaving foreboding impressions of despair and horror in her wake. It has been said that after a truly memorable encounter with Vermina in the realm of Quagmire, nothing unknown can ever frighten a mortal again, for nothing could be as horrific as being in the presence of the Dreamweaver. It is conceivably possible to enter Quagmire while awake by means of magical teleportation, but the dangers associated with it make it an impractical avenue for most mortals to pursue. There have been times when Quagmire and Mundus have appeared to merge, during times when Vermina's influence has been particularly strong or where her artifacts have been in close proximity. The skull of corruption is Vermina's primary artifact. Appearing to be a staff, the skull of corruption creates a duplicate of whomever or whatever it is cast upon. This copy then attacks the original for the sake of the wielder. It is rumored that the staff can feed on the memories of those around it and sometimes will act of its own accord. Vermina presides over the world of dreams and speaks to all mortals at some point in their lives. For some she provides inspiration, while others cringe in horror at the merest mention of her name. Her night terrors lay bare the darkest aspects of the mortal mind, leaving even the bravest among men and myrrh to tremble at the revelations revealed. Those who follow Vermina know that the mortal mind is like clay and very easily molded. Many are eternally changed after the Dreamweaver touches them, released from the grip of fear forevermore. But while Vermina controls the insubstantial world of dreams, there are others who control the darkness of the true and waking world. He is the Daedric Prince of Hedonism and is allied with Vermina as the depths of the mortal soul reveal themselves in the dark desires of the mortal heart. The Daedric Prince gives voice to the deep and hidden impulses some mortals will only acknowledge in their dreams. But that is a story for another day. <laughs>